Good afternoon. I'm David Bush, Executive Director for Preservation Houston. Thank you for being with us this afternoon for Mr. Houston, Jesse Jones' Enduring Legacy. Our online programs support Preservation Houston's mission to promote the preservation and appreciation of Houston's architectural and cultural historic resources through education, advocacy, and committed action. Free access to our online programs is one of our membership benefits. If you are a member of Preservation Houston, thank you for your support. If you're not a member, please join online at preservationhouston.org slash join. Today's presentation is part of the Bart Truxillo program series, named in memory of the pioneer preservationist and Preservation Houston co-founder and made possible through the generosity of our members and BART's family and friends. Preservation Houston is supported in part by a grant from the City of Houston through Houston Arts Alliance and a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities through Humanities Texas. We're also very grateful for the support of Houston Endowment, which was founded by Jesse Jones and his wife, Mary Gibbs Jones, and continues to have a significant positive impact on this region and which you'll be hearing about during this program. Now I'm happy to introduce Preservation Houston Programs Director, Jim Parsons, who'll introduce our speaker. Well, thanks David and thanks to everybody for joining us on a Saturday afternoon. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Stephen Finberg. He's the award-winning author of Unprecedented Power, Jesse Jones, Capitalism and the Common Good. He's also executive producer and co-writer of the Emmy award-winning film, Brother, Can You Spare a Billion? The Story of Jesse H. Jones. And I have to say, Stephen, I think you may be our first Emmy award-winning speaker. So congratulations there. Uh, in addition to producing books and films, Finberg writes articles, editorials, and lectures about how the power of good government can effectively address today's daunting challenges. And there's one thing we have these days, it's daunting challenges. So I'm happy to hear what Stephen has to say. Uh, Stephen, I'll turn it over to you and I will see you uh, at the end of the program for the Q&A. Thank you, Jim. And hello, everybody. I'm so glad to be here today to talk about Jesse Jones, Houston's preeminent developer during the first half of the 20th century. And during the Great Depression and World War II, believe it or not, next to President Franklin Roosevelt, the most powerful person in the nation. Uh, Jim, I think you're going to be in charge of the pictures today. So let's show our first picture. There we go. Jesse Jones was born in Springfield, Tennessee in Robertson County on his father's very prosperous tobacco farm. One of the myths surrounding Jesse Jones is that he was a self-made man and that is not the case. His father was a very successful tobacco farmer and his tobacco was shipped around the world. It was very popular. Uh, Jesse Jones um, shared a couple of experiences he had growing up that I'll share with you today because I, I was very touched by them. He recalls remembering how his father kept their smokehouse doors open so struggling neighbors could come and help themselves if they needed food. But his Aunt Nancy, who was there to take care of the children after Jesse's mother died when the kids were very young, kept track of who took what so she could be eventually repaid. And from the the dance between his father and his Aunt Nancy, Jesse Jones saw the benefits of philanthropy and the benefits of good credit. He left school after the eighth grade and his father put him in charge of one of his tobacco factories. And Jesse said to his father, well, father, I'm so young, I'm gonna be working with people twice my age. Do you think I can do this? And his father said, Jesse, you can do this as well as anybody else I know. And Jesse Jones said that from what his dad said, it instilled confidence in him. And he said, when my father told me that, I believed I could. And he would go on to say that he learned all his business practices and skills and values from his father on the tobacco farm. But the farm wasn't big enough for Jesse. And as he got a little older, he wanted to spread his wings and see what was out in the world. So he moved to Dallas, 
Uh, let's see, what is, uh, yes, I think that would be our next picture. I, I have to tell you, I typically don't speak with pictures, so pardon me if I fumble a little bit. But here's young Jesse when he moves to Dallas at the age of 20 uh, to work for his uncle, M.T. Jones, who was a lumber baron. Uh, they called him a double ender, which I think that means he was vertically integrated. He had vast tracts of timberland throughout East Texas. He had sawmills in Orange, Texas to convert the lumber into finished products. And he had lumber yards throughout Texas and Louisiana to sell the finished products. He also had 6,000 acres along Buffalo Bio that he used to raise grain and graze cattle. And that 6,000 acres is gonna come back into our story in a little bit. Uh, M.T. Jones learned to really appreciate Jesse Jones's business skills and he made him an executor of his estate. And that's what brought Jesse Jones to Houston in 1898, next picture, uh, to become the executor of M.T. Jones's estate after he passed away. Uh, since this is Preservation Houston, I'll mention a couple of the other executors because maybe those names have meaning. It would be J.M. Rockwell and T.W. House. They were also co-executors. But young Jesse was the manager of the state. And this is basically the Houston he found when he arrived in 1898. He moved into the Rice Hotel, which is to the left. It's that five-story building on the left. And he took uh, an office at the Bins Building across the street, then the tallest building in town. Jesse Jones managed MT's estate and he liquidated it for the benefit of his Aunt Louisa and her three kids. And Jesse went into business for himself in the lumber business, but he extended MT's double ender status by one notch and started building houses. He wanted to develop Midtown, what we call Midtown today, but the streets there were muddy. They were not paved. They were not graveled and graded is what they called it back then. Tuam, Chenevert, Gray. That's where he wanted to build houses, but it was mud. So he went to the city government and he said, if you'll pay half the cost of grading and graveling the streets, I'll pay the other half because neither could afford to do it on their own. And he said, and I'll start building small houses and selling them on unique installment plans so people of modest means can afford to build houses. The city agreed to do that. And Jesse Jones built these small houses. And it was a very successful venture for both the city and for Jones. And it was one of the first times when he went into partnership with the government because he never thought government was the enemy. He always thought that government could be used for positive progress. And we'll see that time and time again throughout his life. But this, this collaboration with the city of Houston was the first venture he had with government. It was very successful. Um, I think we are ready for our second, our next picture, which is the boarding house. And this is where Jesse's Aunt Louisa lived at Chenev excuse me, Maine and Anita. And they called it the boarding house because all of the family at one time or another lived there. And now here's the scandal in the story. Uh, Jesse's cousin, Will, Louisa's son, lived in the house with his wife, Mary, but it was not a good marriage. And Mary's granddaughter, Audrey Jones Beck, would later tell me, she said, that's when the sparks started to fly between Jesse and Mary, when Jesse moved to Houston in 1898 and sometimes spent time at the boarding house with the rest of the family. But there was nothing that Mary and Jesse could do about their attraction for each other because divorce back then was out of the question. So they just, you know, did the best they could, kept their distance, but that too will come back later on in the story. So with the proceeds from the mortgages, from the small houses Jesse Jones was building and with loans from Rice Institute, which was then uh, managed by Captain James Baker, who was president at the time, Jesse Jones began building Houston's first skyscrapers. Next picture, please. The Houston Chronicle building was one of the first three. It was 10 floors high. It gave Jesse Jones a half interest in the newspaper, which he would later buy outright in 1926 from publisher M.E. Foster over disputes, uh, editorial disputes over M.E. Foster's endorsement of Ma Ferguson for governor, which Jesse Jones opposed. The first three buildings were all each 10 floors high and they were Houston's biggest buildings. He built the Texas, next picture please. 
He built the Texas Company building, which brought Texaco uh, and Humble Oil Company kept their offices there for a while. But it attracted the petroleum industry because Jones started building buildings for Texaco, Gulf Oil, Humble Oil Company. This is one of the three, only three, uh, the only one of the three buildings that still exists, and it was incorporated in 1926 into the Bankers Mortgage Building, which is still standing at the corner of Maine and Capitol. And you can, you can almost see its outline when you look at the Bankers Mortgage Building today. The third building, next picture please, was the Bristol Hotel. That was built uh, at the corner of Travis and Capitol. And that gave Houston one of its very first luxury hotels. Um, while Jones was building these buildings, a delegation went to the United States Congress to convince them to pay half the cost of building the Houston Ship Channel. It was a great success, and that's what happened. But first, I want to show you the next picture, which is the City Auditorium. Jesse Jones was the building chairman of the City Auditorium. It opened in 1910, just a couple of years after the first three skyscrapers opened. Jesse had traveled throughout Europe with his Aunt Louisa and their kids, and he really appreciated how, how vibrant the cities were, and he attributed part of that to the performing arts. Jesse wanted the same thing for Houston, and at the time, we really had no big place for performances, for conventions, so he became the building chairman of the city auditorium, and this is how it looked when it uh, opened not long after. Edna Saunders deserves mention because she was Houston's impresario who brought performing artists from all over the world to Houston to perform at the City Auditorium, including Enrico Caruso. She deserves mention today, as does Jesse Jones, because they both had such a profound influence on the robust performing arts we have today. Next picture, please. The, the Houston Symphony's first performances were held in Jesse Jones's Majestic Theater. That's next to the Chronicle building. The Majestic Theater was where the Houston Symphony had its first performance, I believe in 1913. So they were great supporters of the performing arts and nurtured them throughout their lives. Next picture, please. So as I said, this delegation went to Congress and convinced them to pay half the cost of building the Houston are dredging the Houston Ship Channel in anticipation of the Port of Houston. The effort was successful. It was called the Houston Plan, and it was not unlike what Jesse Jones had done in 1906 with the city of Houston to get them to grade and gravel the streets of Houston. So this delegation came back to Houston all excited because Congress had agreed to pay half the cost of, of dredging the Houston Ship Channel, and they needed to sell navigation bonds, but nobody knew what navigation bonds really were and didn't have much interest in buying them. So it fell to Jesse Jones, who by then was the go-to guy when anything big in Houston needed to happen. Within 24 hours, he raised Houston's half of the fund by going to bankers, his fellow bankers, uh, to say, this is a great investment in Houston's future. And indeed it was. Jones raised Houston's half of the funds within 24 hours. He became the Houston Harbor Board's first chairman. And in that role, he built the wharfs, the piers, the warehouses that would welcome ships from around the world. All the while, next picture, please. He's also building buildings in anticipation of the 1914 opening of the Houston Ship Channel. And here's the Rice Hotel as it was in 1914 when it first opened with just two wings. And you can see the Houston Chronicle building to the left. Jones also built three more 10 floor buildings on Main Street, one of them for Gulf Oil Company, another for his National Bank of Commerce. Those three buildings are still standing today, although they're kind of unrecognizable. They're called the Mason Block. They're across from the Gulf Building and the Bankers Mortgage Building. Next picture, please. All the while, President Woodrow Wilson was trying to get Jesse Jones to come to Washington and join his administration. He really liked Jones's attitude about government. He, he saw that government could be a progressive power for change. And he wanted to help integrate the South and the West into the rest of the United States because this wasn't all that long after the Civil War. 
But Jones kept turning down Woodrow Wilson because he was so intent on building his businesses and his city. Uh, Wilson asked him to be ambassador. He even offered him uh, a position in his cabinet as treasury secretary, but he kept turning the president down until World War I came along. Woodrow Wilson asked Jones to head one of two major divisions of the American Red Cross, the Department of Military Relief, and Jones could not turn the president down. Next picture, please. In that role, Jesse Jones was responsible for organizing battlefield aid for the military and civilians throughout Europe. He organized hospitals, canteens. He recruited thousands and thousands of nurses and doctors. And we see him here marching down Fifth Avenue. He's on the far left. And you'll, you'll, you'll always recognize him because he's typically the tallest guy in the picture. And that's Woodrow Wilson in the center. And they're marching down Fifth Avenue to raise funds for the American Red Cross, which was the officially designated relief agency during World War I. So Jesse Jones went to Washington and he stayed there for two years organizing medical relief for the military and the civilians of Europe and then the uh, armed services when they came back home. The American Red Cross under his uh, leadership built the first rehabilitation hospitals in the United States to help uh, wounded soldiers recover. So his colleagues kept saying, Jesse, when are you coming back to Houston? You own the biggest bank, the biggest newspaper. You've got buildings going up all over the city. We need you back here. And he would write back and he would say, if you understood and saw what I see here today, because he was in Europe at the time, he said, you would not be asking me to, to stop what I'm doing. What I am doing here is of bigger importance than anything I could possibly do, be doing for business. But within two years, he finally did return to Houston. And next picture, please. He and Mary Gibbs Jones finally got together. Will and Mary divorced in 1919 and Jesse and Mary married in 1920. Jones's Houston Chronicle reported it with a tiny little paragraph buried in the back of the newspaper, but the Houston Post, Jones's competitor said, the couple won't discuss it, but Jesse Jones and Mary Gibbs Jones are now married. And it was kind of front page news for the Houston Post. The Joneses immediately went to New York City where Jesse Jones was building skyscrapers there. Uh, and they love the performing arts. And Mary left diaries behind, and it talks about how many plays they went to, the symphonies they attended, and that they almost needed to have a rest from everything they had been doing while they were there on their honeymoon. Jesse Jones also embarked on the most ambitious phase of his building career. Next picture, please. Oh, there they are again. Sorry, I didn't realize that was gonna pop up, but there, there's the happy couple. So now the next picture, please. He started filling up downtown's Main Street with its biggest skyscrapers, Here's the Kirby Lumber Building, uh, that in the late 1950s or the mid-1950s uh, became the first store for Neiman Marcus outside of Dallas. Maybe some of you are old enough to remember when Neiman Marcus was on Houston's Main Street. Next picture, please. Here's the Commerce Building. Uh, I included this picture because with great foresight, Jesse Jones would put foundations under his buildings that he was building in the 1920s because he thought one of these days he might want to vertically elevate the building, which he would do when he came back from Washington in the 1940s. But here's the short version of the Commerce Tower, which is now a condominium. And if you look at the building today, you can almost see the demarcation from the original building to the elevated portion of the building. Uh, next picture, please. He filled up downtown Main Street with its most luxurious hotels, its most ornate movie theaters, and its tallest office buildings. And here's how Main Street looked during Jesse Jones's heyday. Next picture, please. And some of you remember going to the Metropolitan Theater. Here's the interior. I know I'm giving away my age, but I took the bus downtown uh, to, when I was a little kid to go to the movies at the Metropolitan and the Lowe's. Next picture, please. There we go. And there's the interior of the Lowe's. Both beautiful, ornate movie theaters. They had vaudeville plays. They had pipe organs. They had the latest movies. Next picture, please. In 1926-28, Jones built the Lamar Hotel. 
There are the Lowe's and the Metropolitan Theaters as part of the hotel. And the Joneses lived on the top floor of the hotel. That's why I included this picture. Next picture, please. And while he was filling up Houston's downtown, Fort Worth, and New York City with skyscrapers, Mr. Jones was becoming very involved with democratic national politics. He served as finance chairman of the DNC from 1924 to 1928. And he almost miraculously uh, removed the party's debilitating and persistent debt in time for the 1928 convention, which Mr. Jones captured for Houston. It was the first convention to be held in Houston since the Civil War, and it was one of the first to be widely received over radio. The 24 convention had been broadcast over radio, but most households at that time didn't have radios. But by 1928, I believe about 75% of the nation's homes had radios. This put Houston on the map and Jesse Jones in the spotlight. Now, to give you an idea how much things have changed, the convention site was selected in January for the convention that was to be held in June or July. Whereas today we pick sites two years ahead of time, spend hundreds of billions of dollars to produce them. The site was selected in January for the convention that was held in June, of course, in the heat of Houston summer. And we had no place to, to hold it. But Jesse Jones said, don't you worry, I'll build a place and I'll have it ready for June. And sure enough, within three months, he built the Sam Houston Convention Hall, not to be confused with the, the Coliseum, which is what replaced it, uh, within a matter of three months. And it would hold 25,000 people. And this, we had a population at that time of about 350,000. But it was an enormous boom for Houston and for Jesse Jones. And as the delegates were coming into town and, and walking over to the convention hall, next picture, please. They could see Houston's tallest skyscraper reaching to the sky, the Gulf Building, which was one of Mr. Jones's crowning achievements. Now you can see the Rice Hotel in the background. And I told you about the Mesa block across from it that he was building in anticipation of the opening of the Houston Ship Channel, those uh, three 10 floor buildings. But here's the Gulf Building under construction. It opened just within a matter of months before the October stock market crash of 1929 that ushered in the Great Depression. And Mr. Jones wasn't nearly as worried about Houston as he was for the rest of the nation because Houston still had cotton, lumber, and petroleum to back it up. But by 1931, three banks were in trouble, or two banks, excuse me, were in trouble in Houston. And Mr. Jones realized, this is in 1931, that if those two banks failed, there would be a domino effect across Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana because small rural banks kept their deposits in large urban banks. And if these two banks failed, it would be a disaster across the nation. So he called all the Houston bankers and businessmen to his office, which was now on the top floor of the Gulf Building, and said, we cannot let this happen. It will, it, we have got to be our brother's keeper. But there were people who disagreed and said, if these banks were so poorly managed that they are struggling, then they should be allowed to go out of business. But Jones said that can't happen. And he got Captain James Baker on the phone, who was in, away in Massachusetts at the time, and was also an owner of one of the biggest banks in town. And he convinced the holdovers to come over to Jones' side. And because of Jesse Jones's leadership, no bank in Houston failed during the Great Depression. But that was not the case elsewhere. Next picture, please. President Herbert Hoover, who you see there in the middle, and there's Paul Jesse Jones off to the left, started the Reconstruction Finance Corporation in 1932. And this was a great leap for President Hoover because he did not believe in using government to address these kinds of calamities. And to give you some perspective, the federal budget in 1932 was $4 billion. That's not even $100 billion today. But 
Hoover had been relying on volunteerism, charity, and declarations that confidence is coming back, the economy is sound, everything's going to be fine, but that did not work. The, the decline was calamitous, and Hoover knew he had to do more. So he was flexible and intelligent enough to realize he had to use the power of government to address the calamity. So he started the Reconstruction Finance Corporation in 1932 to make loans to insurance companies, banks, and railroads, thinking that would restore confidence and would get the economy to revive again. He appointed Jesse Jones as one of the uh, board members of the bipartisan board. And once again, Jesse Jones answered the call to service and moved with Mary Gibbs Jones to Washington in 1932 to assume this position. Now, just to, to, it's so interesting as we're grappling with our own problems today. And, and for instance, the pandemic relief bill, how should, big should it be? So President Herbert Hoover, who was loath to use government to do this kind of problem solving, expanded the RFC during his time in office so that its lending authority was almost equal to the size of the federal government's budget. It was three and a half billion dollars and the budget was only four billion. He even provided aid to states and cities, which is, again, something controversial we're dealing with today. But Republican President Herbert Hoover saw the value in doing that and addressed it with the RFC. Now, here's a quote I always use from Jesse Jones because it's so important as, again, we're grappling. Do we go big? Do we go small? Are we moderate with our own aid packages? Jesse Jones would later say, if five to seven billion dollars had been judiciously loaned through an institution such as the RFC in 1931 and 1932, the worst of the Great Depression could have been avoided. And I think that's very important today as we address our own issues. As soon as Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated as president, next picture please, Legislation was passed that allowed the RFC to begin buying preferred stock in banks to recapitalize them so they could lend again. That exact program was duplicated in 2008, and it was called the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP. And it saved the banks in 2008, just like the RFC saved the banks in 1933, because they were all closed when Roosevelt was inaugurated. Unemployment was 25%. Gross national product had been sliced in half. The value of stocks had lost 75% of their value. And people were burning their furniture and eating grass to stay alive. It was a disastrous situation for the United States. So the RFC stepped in, Roosevelt expanded its scope, and within his first 100 days, as we're counting 100 days and seeing what happens within them, he made Jesse Jones the RFC's chairman. The shell shock bankers wouldn't lend this new cash that they were getting by selling their preferred stock to bank to the government. So Jesse Jones had to kind of harass them and say, you know, if you don't start lending this money, the federal government will have to step in and do it. We have got to get the frozen wheels of the economy to turn again. So he would go on the radio in between Jack Benny and Fanny Bryce, kind of like, you know, if he, somebody went on TV today before Modern Family or Dancing with the Stars to talk about the economy and banking. But the, the bankers still would not lend the money. So the RFC became the lender of last resort. And it saved throughout the Great Depression hundreds of thousands of homes, farms, banks, and businesses from bankruptcy and foreclosure. It built tunnels, bridges, aqueducts, and roads throughout the nation. It brought electricity to rural America when 80% of the people there still lived in the dark through the Rural Electrification Administration. And then it helped these people buy appliances on credit through another RFC agency. The RFC saved the railroads, then the nation's largest employer, and helped them finance the development of high-speed trains. And all of these programs worked, despite what pundits might say today. In 1936, four years after Roosevelt's first term in office, industrial output had doubled. 
Unemployment dropped by 8% and Detroit was churning out more cars in 1936 than it had in 1929. And what's most amazing about all of this, all of these monumental programs that were helping the American people were also making money for the United States Treasury and its taxpayers. And that's what hooked me on Jesse Jones. When I realized that, you know, in 1992, when I first started doing work on Jesse Jones, I said, wait a second, why aren't we looking at this now to see how he did what he did and how it can be applied and adapted today? And many of those programs certainly can be used to address our own daunting challenges. So as the economy was beginning to slowly recover from these successful programs, war was spreading throughout Europe and the United States was completely unprepared. We ranked 17th in the world as far as the size of our military. Japan had 7,500 airplanes. Germany had 9,000 airplanes. We had about 2,500 and they were antiquated and left over from World War I. But Roosevelt's hands were tied because of neutrality acts that forbid the United States from selling arms to warring nation. And the public was vehemently opposed to intervention unless the United States was directly attacked. So Roosevelt, as he would usually do when he couldn't get something through Congress, he turned to Jesse Jones and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to begin militarizing industry. And they turned the focus from domestic economics to global defense. And 18 months before the attacks on Pearl Harbor, Jesse Jones and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation began building the massive factories that would manufacture the airplanes, tanks, trucks, and ships that were required to fight and win World War II. And everything they did was comprehensive, whether it was domestic economics or global defense. And again, these are great lessons today as we address the pandemic, as we address more frequent, severe, and intense weather events. Everything they did was global. So, for instance, they not only built the airplanes, they had to manufacture the metal to make the airplanes, but they also produced high octane gasoline to fuel the airplanes. They cornered the market in silk and wool to provide uniforms and parachutes. And maybe the most miraculous thing it did was it orchestrated the development of synthetic rubber from the lab to mass production, just as the Japanese took away our supply of rubber when it conquered the Pacific Ocean. Next picture, please. So during this time, Jesse Jones was becoming more and more powerful and all of the major magazines and radio pundits and you name it, Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Saturday Evening Post, they all said Jesse Jones was the most powerful person in the nation next to Franklin Roosevelt. In fact, Franklin Roosevelt even sometimes called him Jesus Jones. So Roosevelt was getting a little cautious about all this power that Jones was accruing. So he thought if he brought him into his cabinet, it would kind of, you know, check some of his power. So he invited Jones to become Secretary of Commerce. Well, Jones said, yes, I'll be glad to become Secretary of Commerce as long as I can maintain my position as chairman of the RFC. And by that time, Jesse Jones was so popular throughout the United States, he was known as Uncle Jess because the RFC had made loans to every congressional district in the United States of America. It had touched the lives of every American citizen and improved them. And it had made money for the federal government. So Congress liked Jones, the press liked Jones. So there was no backing down when Jones said, yes, I'll be Secretary of Commerce, but I'm going to maintain my other job as chairman of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And that had never happened before when one man was allowed to hold two positions like that in the government. And that's partially where the title from my book came from, Unprecedented Power, because one very conservative Republican Congressman Taft voted to give Jones all of this power because of the integrity of the man, he said. He said, I would not do this for anybody else. This is unprecedented, but Jones deserves the power because he has done such a remarkably good job with what he has been given to do. Next picture, please. That's Jones being sworn in as Secretary of Commerce. Here's the Boeing plant. The RFC, by the time war ended, owned 70% of the aviation industry. 
It owned 100% of the synthetic rubber industry and the majority of the metals industries. But it was never its intention to nationalize any of this. It was always Roosevelt's and Jones's intention to preserve capitalism and democracy. And as war ended, all of this massive capacity was sold back to private industry because the government owned the means of production. It had built these enormous factories and leased them to corporations to operate. But by war's end, they knew they had to convert the economy back into private hands. The last thing that was sold were the synthetic rubber plants, and that was managed by then-Senator Lyndon Johnson. In 1955, when the last synthetic rubber plant was sold, the New York Times reported that it was second in an importance and magnitude only to the atomic energy program. And it was our Jesse Jones who managed that effort. We should really be very proud of everything he did not only in Houston, but during the Great Depression and World War II. The only thing, I'm, let's see, I'm not sure what the next picture is going to be, but I think I know, so let's go to the next picture. That's Well, that's not what I expected, but that's okay, because that's Will Clayton and Mr. Jones and their wives selling war bonds in the RFC office. Mr. Jones had recruited Will Clayton, who had already served a time in federal government, to come back and orchestrate uh, the accumulation of strategic materials from around the world. Will Clayton was a cotton broker with an international reputation, and he did a magnificent job of cornering the markets whenever it was needed, of, of getting everything out of Latin America that was possible, and to keep them out of the Axis powers' hands. And they were also great bridge partners, the four people, the two couples. Next picture, please. The only thing that could bring Mr. Jones back to Houston from Washington in the middle of the war was the marriage of his granddaughter, Audrey Jones Beck, to John Beck. And this was in 1942. According to Audrey, it was the first military wedding to be held in Christ Church Cathedral in downtown Houston. Next picture, please. And here is the charming couple not long after they were married. And I had the great privilege and joy of becoming friends with Audrey. And the first time she, and she was really a character and lots of fun. And the first time I saw this picture, I said, Audrey, were you all just the most beautiful couple in town? And without missing a beat, she said, no, dear, we were the most fun. And I'm sure they were. So remember the 6,000 acres I told you about from M.T. Jones? That's when it comes back to our story. So M.T. Jones had the 6,000 acres along Buffalo Bio. When he passed away, it was uh, inherited by his son, Will Jones. When Will Jones passed away, it was inherited by his son, Tilford, Audrey's father. When Tilford passed away, the 6,000 acres went to Audrey. And Audrey and John began selling off the acreage to accumulate impressionist and post-impressionist masterpieces from every major and lesser known artist that existed. Next picture, please. Because it was their intention to create what Audrey called a teaching collection for students. She wanted the very best painting by each impressionist and post-impressionist artist so you could have a complete survey of the period. And I discovered this picture just yesterday and I asked Jim if we could please include it because if you see on the back wall, there's Modigliani's painting that's now hanging at the Museum of Fine Arts in the Beck collection in the Audrey Jones Beck building. And this is their living room. They really went all out for Christmas as you can tell. Next picture, please. So the Joneses returned to Houston from Washington in 1946. They had been there for 13, 14 years. And Jesse Jones began building again. This is the Houston Club building, which he built on the site of the Bristol Hotel, one of his first skyscrapers. And this was his last skyscraper. And he started adding something to his buildings that he had never done before back in the 20s when he was building, parking garages. He wrote to his colleague in Detroit, uh, Mr. Fisher of uh, Fisher Body Works, because Mr. Fisher had been building buildings there with parking garage. He said, show me how to do this, send the blueprints. And from then on, every building Mr. Jones built also included a parking garage. But the Jones's main focus when they returned was on philanthropy. Next picture, please. 
the Jones, oh, excuse me, that I guess let's talk about this one first. This one shows you the scope of Jesse Jones's buildings in Houston by the 1950s. This is the buildings that you see in red are the buildings Mr. Jones built and owned. Now we'll go to philanthropy. Next picture, please. So the Joneses in 1937 established Houston Endowment. And during the 1940s and 50s, after they came back from Washington, they began transferring all of their buildings and banks and newspapers into Houston Endowment. And they thought education was the key to a vibrant community. And they established scholarship programs throughout the state and universities and colleges. And one of the many things I found that impressed me about them, they always divided the scholarships equally, half for women, half for men, and always a portion for minorities. And these are the scholarship winners from Prairie View a and University in 1946, where the Joneses established an enormous scholarship program back then in 1946, which was a, an incredibly rare and brave thing to do in the deeply segregated South. And I was very touched not long ago to see an announcement in the Houston Chronicle that the Houston Endowment still supports Prairie View a and Next picture, please. The Joneses knew the value of the arts. And one of the last things Jesse Jones said to his nephew, John T. Jones Jr., who took over from Jesse, was, remember, Houston needs a better performing arts hall, because all we really had back then was the city auditorium. And by the 1950s, 1960s, it really had become run down and dilapidated, but it was the home of the Houston Symphony one night and wrestling the next night. And the, the Houston Symphony players were kind of aghast at what they had to walk over when they came into the hall for rehearsals the next day. In 1948, Jesse Jones and, and Mary were attending the Metropolitan Opera presentation that Edna Saunders had brought back to Houston after they had been gone for decades. And Edna Saunders visited with Mr. Jones in his box at the City Auditorium, and that's when the dream of a new performing arts hall began. So Jesse Jones died in 1956, but he had said to his, his nephew, don't forget, Houston needs a better performing arts hall. So in 1962, the trustees of Houston Endowment, including John T. Jones Jr. and Audrey Beck, the Jones's granddaughter, offered to the city of Houston the gift of a performing arts hall. Houston Endowment would build it and give it to the city as a gift. Next picture, please. And they spared no expense, making it the best that they could. This is the ceiling that moved because the auditorium was multi-purpose. It housed the Houston Grand Opera, the Houston Symphony, the Houston Ballet, and the Society for the Performing Arts, all in this one space because it was the only place available for them to perform. And it became the foundation for their success. But the ceiling is really cool because it can move to adjust the size of the hall and the acoustics of the hall, depending on the size of the audience and their performance. Next picture, please. So Mr. Jones passed away in 1956, just when Houston reached its one millionth citizen. When he arrived in Houston in 1898, there were 40,000 people here. So he got to see his city grow and thrive. And I'm very happy to be here today to talk with you about Jesse Jones and to answer any questions you might have. Jim, I'm turning it back to you. Well, thank you, Stephen. It's, it's, it's so much information to, to take in. I think it's gonna take a second for me to, to process, uh, but what, what a great story and, and what an inspiring story of a really consequential Houstonian. Um, I think a lot of people, of course, know Jesse Jones's name and, and people may know part of his story, but I think what's great about today is we got to hear so much and, and the way that you threaded it together uh, really helps to show, you know, some of his influences. And I liked how, you know, something that was important to him early on would come back later in life. And, you know, this part of the story would come back. Um, just as a well, reminder, next, next, time you do, next time I do this, I need a teleprompter. <laughs> it's hard to tell this whole story, <laughs> I, I, but, I it's, think but it's a great story and one worth, worth acknowledging because Mr. Jones was truly a, 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 a figure in American history that deserves to be remembered today. 
not only for what he did, but for the models that he provides today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I, I do want to ask you a couple of questions about that too. But just as a reminder uh, for anybody watching, uh, please do send in questions. Uh, you can use that Q&A box with the icon that looks like two speech bubbles. Uh, you can also put a question or comment in the chat window if that's easier for you. I'm keeping an eye on both. Uh, so uh, we'll certainly welcome those. Stephen, there is one thing that you didn't mention that I would like to bring up. This is this is my question for you. Uh, but one of the things that you've be become involved in through your scholarship of Jesse Jones is the uh, uh, National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Do I have that right? Would you That's mind talking about that for a moment? I would be more than happy to. Uh, an organization began a couple of years ago to create an infrastructure bank very similar to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. They're having great success getting endorsements from state governments, city governments, unions, and they are modeling this infrastructure bank on what Jesse Jones and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did during the Great Depression and World War II. Um, what is so wonderful about the idea of an infrastructure bank, it can weatherize our power plants, it can fortify our electric grid, it can bring broadband and internet access throughout the nation, especially to remote areas. It can build storm surge barriers to protect our port of Houston. And if it models itself, which it is doing like the RFC, it can do these monumental tasks with no new taxes and no new federal debt and also create millions of good paying jobs across the nation. Sounds great. Sounds like sounds like something that we need for sure. So. We do, we do. You know, we talk about the uh, Green New Deal and whenever I hear the Green New Deal, I thought, no, what we really need is a new RFC because <laughs> it can address our monumental challenges today, whether it's the pandemic, where it's, whether it's the impact of more intense and frequent weather events. Uh, a new infrastructure bank can help people um, retrofit their houses so they're storm resistant, energy efficient, and wired for the new world, uh, all at no cost to taxpayers, no new federal debt, and it will create millions of new jobs, reduce fossil fuel emissions, uh, spur the green energy economy and protect people's homes and livelihoods. So uh, how soon can we get that set up? <laughs> there is a bill in Congress, as a matter of fact, as we speak, uh, to uh, create a bank such as what we're discussing. So I would urge everybody to contact their congressmen and congresswomen and endorse a new infrastructure bank. And also go to the website for the National uh, Coalition. The National Infrastructure Bank Coalition has a website. Go check it out. Sounds promising for sure. Okay, I, I thought we might have some questions related to this, and we do. Um, and I guess it's it's kind of a two-parter. Um, so you referred to Audrey Jones Beck as the Jones's granddaughter, but but Jesse Jones didn't actually have any children himself, correct? That's correct. And I, I'm always so tickled that somebody recognizes that every time I give this talk. You're right. Whoever asked that question, the Joneses had no children of their own. But Mary, through her first marriage to Will Jones, had a son named Tilford. Tilford had Audrey. So Audrey was Mary's biologic grandchild, but she was Jesse Jones's third cousin. But Audrey will say she had two sets of parents, her own and Jesse and Mary, because she spent as much time with Jesse and Mary as she did with her own parents. And I showed you a picture of their apartment at the Lamar Hotel. Audrey had a room at the Lamar Hotel in their apartment. Uh, she went to Mount Vernon College near Washington, D.C. and spent a lot of time with the Joneses in Washington. She would stand in for Jesse, uh, launching battleships when he couldn't do it. So she was as close with Jesse and Mary and considered them her second set of parents. And even though she was not Jones's biologic grandchild. OK, that's a that's a good explanation there. Um, and the, the second part of this question is, um, what direct descendants of Jesse Jones remain active in Houston today and, uh, and what are they doing? Uh, his descendants are primarily his brothers, I have to think about this, his brothers' grandchildren. 
uh, the children of John T. Jones Jr., his nephew, and his other sis and his sisters, some of his uh, nieces and nephews, are very active in Houston uh, today. Jay Jones, for instance, is is a very prominent citizen of our city, uh, and so there are a lot of nieces and nephews of the Joneses who are are here and very active in Houston's activities. Okay. Um... Oh, okay. I, I, I warmed you up with these questions uh, so we can tee up a, a really easy one like this. What do you think possessed Jesse Jones to give so much of himself to public service? That's a very good question. And when Jesse Jones first moved to Houston, and I wished I had said this earlier, but I'm glad somebody asked this, everything was locally owned the banks, the newspapers, the insurance companies, everything was locally owned. So the businessmen knew they would prosper only if their community thrived. So they were constantly nurturing a relationship with their community while building their businesses. They saw the two as connected. They needed to build their community in order for their businesses to be successful. And Jesse Jones embraced that through everything that he did. You can always see that he always kept his line. When I, I say this in, in the book about his government service, that he kept his line on the bottom line, his eye on the bottom line and on the common good. And that's why the RFC was so spectacularly successful. And we need an administrator like that today. But that's really where that came from. It was this idea, I will prosper if my community thrives, whether it's local, national or international. That was Jesse Jones's belief and, and how he behaved accordingly. And, I, and I think also, also that 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 little story I told about, you know, the smokehouse doors back in Tennessee, he saw how his father, you know, helped his neighbors, but he also saw how his aunt Nancy kept track of who took what so they could be repaid. And he saw the benefits of both. Yeah. So so he he had that in his upbringing. And I guess he he was just the kind of person to really take that and run with it, if you will. Um, yeah, it's, it's I mean, I was just thinking as you were talking and then as you were answering that, um, you know, in today's environment and the way that that we just kind of react to everything and in the, the it, it's just, it's hard to imagine somebody who legitimately had the public good in mind, because, you know, we, we've been conditioned to think, well, this person is doing this, but what's their real motive? And, and I think, you know, it, it's refreshing to think about somebody who really was interested in, in helping everybody and bringing the community and bringing the country up. Well, and because it was good for his business and it was good for his community it was, I mean, you could see the, I mean, building the Rice Hotel at the same time that the Houston Ship Channel opened. The Houston Ship Channel had an enormous impact on Houston's vitality, but he was also prepared for it commercially. Nothing wrong with that. You know, he made sure that the, that both worked well. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to say something about Woodrow Wilson because he's become kind of a controversial figure. And Jones was very close with the Wilsons. In fact, he created a pension for Woodrow Wilson after he left office because there were no pensions for presidents back then. But, Will, but Jones was always a step ahead of Wilson socially. For instance, in 19, 1918, when Jones was uh, director of military relief for the American Red Cross, he wrote to Wilson, and I, I just gasped when I saw this letter when I was creating the archive with Barry Scardino uh, back in 92, I came across this letter that Jones wrote to President Wilson that nurses deserved military rank. And by giving nurses military rank, they will be encouraged to pursue careers in medicine, law, and education. The Houston Chronicle, Jesse's Houston Chronicle, endorsed women's right to vote in 1915, five years before women got the right to vote. So he was always a little bit of step ahead of everybody else when it came to social issues. The 1946 um, scholarship program at Prairie View A&M is a perfect example of that. It made front page news because, mm -hmm. you know, people just didn't do those kinds of things back then. But Jesse Jones did. Oh, that's great. Um, and I, I, I love the story about the nurses, too. That was definitely forward thinking. And it's, it's interesting when you start looking at some of the attitudes that came out of World War One, where uh, not just Jesse Jones, but you see other people who were saying, look at what these nurses did. Look at what these volunteers did. You know, these women deserve more than, than what we're giving them. So it's right. That's, a, that's an interesting kind of historical side note there. Well, and, and also when they created Houston Endowment, 
not only did they provide a lot of educational scholarships, they provided a lot of nursing scholarships because they did, Jones was one of the original board members of the Texas Medical Center, but he realized that the Texas Medical Center could not grow without an adequate supply of nurses. So they really went full steam ahead on providing scholarships to train nurses. Um, one, one, it's not a question, but a comment. And, and I, I think this is an astute one. Um, someone says that they can see a lot of uh, kind of Jesse Jones's philosophy in Mattress Mac today, um, you know, and he's, he's one of the first when we have a crisis to open his doors um, and, uh, and offer help to people. So that's, that's a good point. Yes. Um, I thought that was at HEB as well. HEB too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, did Jesse and Mary Jones have any religious affiliation? Methodist. They were Methodists. They, uh, in fact, Jesse Jones was the building chairman for St. Paul's Methodist Church two times because uh, it built two different buildings. And the one across from the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, uh, he was the building chairman. And the bells in the tower were dedicated and donated by Louisa Jones. Uh, I think there's a plaque in the lobby that says, to the glory of God and in memory of Martin Topher Jones, you know, the chimes and the, and the tower are, were a gift from the Jones family. Oh, great. Um, and there's so, great I mean, that, that, that whole area, I mean, there's the Audrey Jones Beck building, there's St. Paul's uh, Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. It's all, and it's all part of the Jones family. Yeah. There's a, there's a great picture uh, of, I, I guess, Jesse Jones, uh, participating in the cornerstone laying of St. Paul, the current St. Paul's, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, because he was the building chairman. Um, so uh, he, here's a question that, that kind of comes out of, of what we've been talking about. Um, when you're politically powerful and wealthy, you, you pick up some enemies along the way. Uh, who were some of the famous folks who opposed Jesse Jones, either in business or politics, if there were any? Ooh, that's a good question. And, you know, that was really a challenging one for me because I, when I wrote my book, I did not want it to be a puff piece, but I couldn't find much bad to say about Jesse Jones. He didn't seem to have many enemies. Now, I know he and Hugh Roy Cullen crossed swords about zoning in Houston, mm -hmm. uh, and they had some very heated words about that. Um in Washington, like I said, he was revered because of the power of the purse. He, he made loans to every congressional district in the United States of America. Democrats, Republicans, liberals and conservatives all embraced him. They all liked him. And uh, because they saw his intentions were good, although good intentions these days don't don't go too far sometimes. Uh, but uh, it, it's really hard to pinpoint enemies. Um, and I guess I really wasn't much interested in, in his enemies. I was more interested in what he did and how he did it and how we can adapt some of those strategies today. But the one who comes to mind would be Hugh Roy Cullen. And of course, once I, I we stop all this, I'll think of three or four others. I said, oh, darn, I should have said such and so. But if I think of somebody, I'll let you know. <laughs> I guess, um, I, I mean, one of the most high profile sort of, it's you wouldn't call it an enemy, but I guess Henry Wallace, who was FDR's, Vice President. There you go. It wasn't the yeah. enemy of Jones's, but he kind of gunned for his position, right? He well, that I mean, they they really represented completely different ideological approaches to government. Uh, and you're right. They they you know I think a, a chapter in the book is called you know ask God to stop him from lying, something like that, which was a reference to Henry Wallace. And they did. They fought constantly over turf and ideology. Uh, for instance, here's a good one. During 1933-34, th we were swamped with too much corn and oats and wheat and commodity prices were crashing. The farmers were growing broke and they were losing their farms. So Henry Wallace wanted passed a law or, or a program for farmers to plow under the thir a third of their crops and to kill their pigs. Jesse Jones thought this was wild because he grew up on a farm and he was a banker and he was a lender. The program, they, they implemented the program and it did not work. It was horrible. Uh, but what Jesse Jones did was create the Credit Commodity Corporation, another RFC subsidiary. 
And he would then, they would take farmer surplus crops and store them and make loans on those crops to the farmers. Let's say corn was nine cents a pound. They would take the corn off the market at 10 cents a pound, lend the farmer at 10 cents a pound so he could pay his bills, save his farms. By taking those crops off the market, it created scarcity. The prices went up. The farmers got their crops back. They sold them at a profit, paid back their loans, and the government made money on the program. And it was so popular, it started to cover almost every commodity, including figs. You know, I mean, they did it for everything back then. So, yes, there was a great clash between Jones and Wallace. So I'm thank you for remembering that. Uh, well, it's 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 the only one that I could think of that would come close to to any. I mean, it it really wasn't a. I don't know that it was that you would call them, you know, personal enemies. But you're right. It was it was coming at at, at no, issues. because you know, people didn't seem to behave like that back then. They could have differences of opinion, but still be civil with each other. They didn't consider each other enemies. You know, they had differing views, and one and they would fight tooth and nail to prevail. And Jesse Jones often did. Now, there were certainly conservative forces and liberal forces of the New Deal who were opposed to Jones because he kind of walked the middle line. He mm. said that he was more of a Democrat than a New Dealer. And oftentimes he would not fund programs if he didn't think the government would get its money back because he was very cautious lender. And I think that's a really important differentiation between the RFC and everything else. The RFC was a lending institution, not a spending institution. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it has so much credibility and promise for today. Um, let's see, there are, there's, there are several good ones here. So um, I'm glad people are interested in asking, that's nice. Oh, people are, absolutely. Um, can you speak to the influence of Jesse Jones on newspaper publishing in Houston? Because of course he was associated with the Chronicle for so long. Um, hmm, how do I answer that? Uh, he owned the Houston Chronicle. Um, I, I really don't have a lot to offer about that uh, because again, the hobbies and the Joneses, the hobbies owned the Houston Post, the Joneses owned the Houston Chronicle. They were very close friends. Uh, Bill Hobby was one of Jesse Jones's closest friends, as a matter of fact, but they were competitors. Um, I, I don't really have a lot more to offer about the Houston Chronicle. Um, I guess one question I, I, would, be, I would have to think about, you know, the, the city had three papers back then. We had the Houston Chronicle, the Houston Press and the Houston Post. Mm -hmm. uh, the Houston Chronicle was the last survivor, you know, it was the last one standing. Yeah. I, I, I guess a kind of another way to frame that question might be um, how much of a role did Jones take in the Chronicle? I mean, he was the owner, but, you know, was, was, did, did he, did he kind of micromanage, you know, how, to no, what extent no. was he interested and, in? And, that, and that's, that's a good question because it, it, it allows me to talk about his ability to delegate because people will ask me, how did one man do so much at once? And I thought about that too. He was able to delegate. He knew how to find the best people for the job. And then he would not micromanage them. He would let them do their job and go on to the next thing. Now, when M.E. Foster was the publisher back in you know, the 1920s, I remember that there was a, a very scathing series that Foster wanted to publish about the Ku Klux Klan. And he sent the series to Jones and said, our lives could be threatened if we publish this. And Joan said, it doesn't matter. We need to do the right thing, publish this. So Jones was always on the side of doing the right thing, whether it was going to hurt him commercially or even physically, he would not back down. Hmm. That's a good, I, I, I like that story. And I think he he shares that with, uh, with the hobbies because I know there are some stories where you know, there were there were things that they published that might not have been advantageous to them politically or personally, but they they said, you know, the news is the news, and that's yeah. our job to put it out there. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and and one other question, um, because we're talking about the the newspapers, how did Ross Sterling interact with Jesse Jones? Um, well, Ross Sterling owned the Houston Post mm -hmm. and went bankrupt. Jesse Jones bought the Houston, you know, took it out of receivership or somehow he became the owner of the Houston Post. So at one time, Jesse Jones owned both 
newspapers in town, the Houston Post, the two major ones, Houston Post and Houston Chronicle. But he eventually sold the Houston Post to the Hobbies. But, you know, he wanted to help rescue Russ Sterling. And that's why he bought the Houston Chronicle. I mean, the Houston Post from him. Yeah, but but it's interesting that he wasn't that, that he didn't have the inclination to, you know, get the Houston Post and then close the Houston Post down. No, no. I think he understood that a, a vibrant city needed more than one newspaper back then. <laughs> right. Um, and Stephen, if you don't mind going for a few more minutes, we've there's there's some other things I'd like to ask if you if you still oh, please do. I just hope I can answer them. No, oh, I, I think I think you can. Um, one one point on the clash between uh, Cullen and, and Jesse Jones over zoning. Can you remind folks uh, which side, which man was on, who was pro-zoning and who was anti-zoning? Uh, now I, I knew, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, I think Jones was for zoning and Cullen was against it. But I, don't I, hold I, me to that. I think that's, a, am I, am I right? Do you know? I'm, I'm pretty sure that you're right. And uh, yeah. yeah. And I, and I think it, I mean, Cullen was an interesting character because, uh, you know, jo Jones had the idea that government could work for the people. And Cullen was really sort of of the, the idea that the government should stay out of everybody's business and the government, you know, shouldn't tell you what to do with your land and shouldn't tell you where to live and shouldn't tell you what to build. And Jones kind of saw the benefit of, I guess, government making things more orderly would be an easy way to say it. So I think yes, they yes, butted heads on yes, that. Yes. And, um, and Cullen wrote Jones a scathing letter that I will, I will not repeat. Uh, it was pretty awful, the things he called Jones. Uh, but I, I remember a story. I did an oral history program before I made the film and wrote the book. I did an oral history program because I realized back in the 90s, there were still people living who knew Jesse Jones, like John Kenneth Galbraith and Stanley Marcus, but also his driver, um, August Waits, a black man. And I had the privilege of meeting August Waits and interviewing him. And he told me the story of driving Mr. Jones to the San Jacinto Inn to meet with Hugh Roy Cullen over lunch. Jesse Jones says to August Waits, come on in and have lunch. And Mr. Waits said, well, Mr. Jones, you know, we're, I'm not permitted to go in there. And Mr. Jones said, you just wait a second. And Mr. Jones went into the San Jacinto Inn. He got a table in the middle of the restaurant and he invited August Waits to be his guest. Hmm. So there's a, a nice story, and that's in the 1940s as well. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. So that just gives you a little more insight into what kind of human being Jesse Jones was. Well, it's, it's I mean, it's interesting that he had those opinions being a, you know, born and raised Southerner. I mean, from the, from the deep, deep South too. So. Yes, yes, exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. One of our <laughs> one of our attendees from Austin um, says he's interested in knowing the influence that Jones had in funneling federal funding to Austin for infrastructure projects. And I don't know if that means Austin specifically or, or statewide. Uh, I could see no favoritism in anything Jesse Jones did. He couldn't. I mean, he would have been, you know, called out if he had favored Texas over other states for uh, federal spending. Now, the synthetic rubber plants, uh, you could wonder why were they all located along the Texas and Louisiana Gulf Coast? Uh, that was because of proximity to oil and because they were safer there. They were, they were still in, in port cities, but they weren't on the Atlantic or the Pacific. Mm -hmm. So that's why they chose to uh, uh, locate the synthetic rubber plants primarily along the Texas and Louisiana Gulf Coasts. And... And that had a, a profound effect on the economy of Texas and Louisiana after the war, because it just it created so much employment and a whole new petrochemical industry. But that's what World War II did. The government made these massive investments that basically created the middle class of the 1950s because of what the government had done in the 1930s and the 1940s. And I think it's so important to remember that when people bash government as being something bad, or as Mr. Jones said in 1937 during one of his many radio addresses about economic recovery, he said, it cannot be achieved if we allow ourselves to believe that our government is our enemy. He would never have said anything disparaging about the government because he would have thought that to be very unpatriotic. And I agree with him. Right. It's, it's, 
it, it's really refreshing to think about that attitude. We need more of that uh, these we days. We do. We do. We, especially now with everything we've got going on here, we need an active government that works for the benefit of its people. Mm -hmm. And I, that's that's not a that's not a partisan statement. That's true. No matter no, no. matter what side you're coming from, it's it's yeah. It's we. It's anyway. Um, okay, here's here's a two parter uh, tying Jones or or not to other high profile Houstonians. Uh, how did he interact with the Hogg family and or Howard Hughes? Uh, with Howard Hughes, that's a very interesting question because uh, the RFC. Uh, helped fund some of Hughes's ventures in aeronautics, mm -hmm. uh, and most specifically through the Department of Commerce. Um, so um, Jones helped Howard Hughes. Probably the one thing he did that wasn't so good through the RFC was to donate or, or to invest a little money in the Spruce Goose, uh, which never really went very far, but you know, back then they were trying everything they possibly could to make the economy work again, to defend the United States and, and the allied forces. So his relationship with Hughes was really through the government and through uh, helping him with his aviation uh, efforts. Uh, what about the hogs? I don't, don't recall much, much with the hogs. I, I guess you, I mean, yeah, he, he, I, told you, I, I told you I'm not going to be able to answer every one of your questions, but I really don't recall, you know, I, I guess with I'm a hog because they, they were, you know, he was such a, a supporter of the Houston symphony. In fact, yeah. there is a picture. Okay. This brings up something good. I'm glad you're asking me these questions because again, it gives us insight into what Jesse Jones did. Um, there's a picture of Jesse Jones, John T. Jones his Jr., his nephew, and I'm a hog signing contracts in the 1950s for Jesse Jones's radio station, KTRH, which is still on the air today, but Jesse Jones started that radio station in 1929. Uh, but in 1955, they signed contracts to broadcast Houston Symphony performances over KTRH radio so everybody could have access to the music. And he did that with I'm a hog. Oh, that's a that's a great one. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for asking. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're pulling out these things from my brain that I haven't thought about in a while. Well, it's, it's good to get a little exercise uh, for the brain during COVID, you know, so we can. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, OK, here, here's another one that, that may be a little tough, but it is an interesting one. Uh, and, and I'm glad somebody asked this because I live in Midtown and I was curious about this too. Are there any examples of the little houses that Jesse Jones built in Midtown that are still standing that you know of? Not that I know of. Now, where you can go find out if you really want to know. Uh, so one of the jobs I had at Houston Endowment early on was assembling Jesse Jones's archives. A grant officer, Ann Hamilton, in the Bankers Mortgage Building, where Houston Endowment's offices originally were, discovered this huge walk-in safe filled with all of Jesse Jones's business and personal papers. So Houston Endowment hired Barry Scardino, uh, a wonderful archivist and historian, uh, to begin assembling all these papers into an archive. And after I did my, I was supposed to be there for three months in 92 to write a biographical sketch about Jesse Jones for an annual report. Once I had finished that job, they said, would you like to help Barry assemble this archive? I said, God, yes, that sounds very interesting. And that's really when I began to discover more and more about Jesse Jones. I would read these things. I said, oh, my God, why aren't we learning more about this man? And of course, you know, then I went on to do all these different projects about him. Um, what was your question? <laughs> well, it's oh, not the... You were, you were talking about if anybody wanted to find out if there were any other... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry. I, I, I really went off on a tangent there. So... excited about archives. That happens. The documents for all the houses that he built and sold in 1906, 1907 are still in the archives, which are now housed at the Woodson Research Center in the Fondren Library at Rice University. So... Okay. To answer the question, if somebody really wanted to go see if these houses existed, they can go look in the archives for the addresses because the sales contracts are still there. Okay, so that could that could be a good sleuthing project if somebody really wants to know. And yeah, I know yeah. I know the staff at the Woodson, and they'd probably get pretty excited about trying to track things down too. So 
Uh, yes, yes. Um, and it's a really remarkable collection. It is Houston's early business history with photographs and contracts. You know, the construction contracts for the golf building, the, the tallest building in Houston from 1929 until the 1960s when Humble Oil Company opened its building on Bell. Mm -hmm. But all the contracts for that building are there, as are the little houses uh, that he built in 1906. Oh, that's great. Um, and lots of cool pictures, too, which some of which we saw today. Yeah, the pictures were great. And thank you for thank you for providing all of those. They're they're fantastic. Um, we do have I, some. I was glad to do it. I, like I said, I've never talked with pictures before. I usually just blather on. So <laughs> I was glad that I could, uh, you know, coordinate my talk with some of those images. No, it was it was great, uh, and we do have some amens to uh, good government. So there's there's people oh, out there good. who believe, and it's yeah, it 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 made me feel optimistic too. Um, so okay, uh, to to wrap up, and it uh, this is this is a good question. Uh, what do you think is the single most important thing that Jesse Jones contributed to Houston or to the nation? And that, that may be a tough one because uh, that's a big question. Big here. I mean, because first of all, you've got Houston Endowment. You know, it, it donates somewhere between 75 and 80 million dollars every year to nonprofit organizations serving greater Houston to create a community where the opportunity to thrive is available to everyone. Those that's what the Joneses wanted. So you have Houston Endowment. But I, I can't help but think his legacy lies with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation as a model for today of really good government that helped people during the worst of the Great Depression, that militarized industry in time to fight and win World War II. The RFC essentially saved capitalism and saved democracy. And for most of the time, it cost taxpayers not a dime. So. Mm -hmm. That is what interested me most about Jesse Jones, what motivated me to keep looking into his life, to write a book, to make a film, to talk today. I, I think that so much of the reconstruction finance strategies can be adapted today to address our own daunting challenges. But first we have to embrace the power of good government. And I think that's probably his biggest legacy is that he shows the power of good government. Yeah, it's, 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 it's just amazing to think uh, how much of his work is relevant right now, you know? It's, it is, yeah, it really is. And so many of the art, I mean, again, if, if we take the time to look at the past, look at successes from the past for solutions today, they exist. I mean, one of my favorite ones uh, from the uh, Great Depression was uh, helping people buy appliances on credit after the re uh, Rural Electrification Administration brought power to their areas, but they had no money. It was the Great Depression. So a farmer could go into an appliance store and buy a fan, a toaster, a radio, and a refrigerator. The RFC would reimburse the appliance store. The utility company selling the, uh, the power to the new customer would put a small monthly charge in the customer's bill with a little interest, forward those proceeds to the RFC. By 1943, when the program was discontinued because it was no longer needed, it had helped over a million families buy appliances. And according to Jones, it made a tidy profit for the United States government. And I contend that same strategy could be used today instead of promoting energy consumption, could be used to promote energy conservation by helping people finance the retrofitting of their homes and buildings so they're energy efficient, storm resistant, and wired for today's world. It's you make a solid. <laughs> <laughs> um, one one more uh, thing before we wrap up, and, and this is a question that I know you'll be able to answer. Um, we got a comment from someone who just ordered a copy of your book, and can you please repeat the title of the book for everybody who might be interested? Hold on, you can do better than that, right? I should have had this here with me. Here it is: <laughs> Unprecedented Power. And what's the subtitle? Jesse Jones, Capitalism, Jesse and the Jones, Capitalism and the Common Good. And I want to point out something. I'm particularly proud the cover endorsement on a picture of two Democrats, Roosevelt and Jones, was supplied by former Secretary of State James Baker. 
Now talk about nonpartisan. And <laughs> what he says, and I'm not plugging the book, what I'm plugging is the power of good government. And it's embodied in the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. James Baker says, a must read for those wanting to learn how a great nation and a great man can respond to difficult challenges. That's so now, since you asked. <laughs> <laughs> not, not so bad. Uh, Stephen, thank you. This was wonderful. And I know everybody appreciated it. Um, you, can, you can tell by the great questions. So thank you for being so generous with your time. And I'm glad we were finally able to schedule this. I was too. And thank you to Preservation Houston for all the great work it does to preserve Houston's history, to preserve its architectural and historic gems. Your services are invaluable. And thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jim. Thanks again for being with us. If you are a member, we appreciate your support. If you're not a member, please join online, preservationhouston.org slash join. Have a good evening.